Excellent. So this article was mindfulness-based stress reduction versus escitalopram for the treatment of adults with anxiety disorders. So the topic initially caught my interest. Um, as a pharmacist, I think part of our job is looking and evaluating drug therapy. Um, but I think an equally important part of our job is recognizing when medications aren't the best fit um, and when there might be other options that are appropriate for patients. Um, so I, I, the title really appealed to me. So we're going to dive into um, the article and look at those results. I'm using just a standard template. Um, this is a way to break up the slides of the journal club because I know that they can be dry sometimes and you can see our progress. So if these are painful for anyone in particular, hopefully this helps you see how close we are to the end. So this article was published in uh, just recently in JAMA Psychiatry. It was available electronically toward the end of last year. And the um, I thought it interesting um, because the authors came from a couple different uh, professions and from a couple different locations, really honing in on um, interprofessional collaboration um, as well as interdisciplinary collaboration. So in looking at the background, anxiety disorders are among the most common type of mental illnesses. It's estimated that the global prevalence through 2019 was about 301 million people. Um, this was <clears throat> just a snapshot looking at lifetime prevalence, the number of individuals who have experienced anxiety at any point in their life. So they'd be able to say yes, um, even if it wasn't something that was current. The this came from <clears throat> also a, a recent publication in um, Lancet Psychiatry, and they were looking at trends. So the data from 2019 was 301 million people, but they're seeing a pretty significant escalation. Um, anxiety disorders have been prevalent previously, but in 1990, did anybody want to venture a guess of what they were estimating the anxiety prevalence to be at that point? I'll tell you it's lower than 301 million. 100 million. You're you're close. You're close. So it was 104 million. Um, so they've really seen a pretty significant escalation um, in those who have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders. Um, unfortunately, with the increase in the number of individuals who are experiencing anxiety disorders, not all of them are currently engaged in treatment. Um, sometimes that's voluntary, sometimes it's due to circumstances that are outside um, of the patient's control. We have very well-established treatment guidelines for anxiety disorders, um, psychotropic medications, things like um, antihistamines, use short-term, benzodiazepines use short-term, and then our class of antidepressant medications to target anxiety have relatively robust data to show improvement um, in some of the anxiety symptoms. But long-term, we, we have a difficult time in keeping patients on their medication. Um, it's estimated that more than two-thirds of patients on antidepressant medications for anxiety won't stay on it for six to 12 months. Um, so within the three to six month time frame after they've had some response, we do see a pretty significant tailing off of individuals continuing in treatment. Other options that are first line for our anxiety disorder, things like psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, also can work incredibly well depending on the anxiety disorder, things like generalized anxiety disorder. There are trials that demonstrate that psychotherapy or CBT can be equally effective to our antidepressant medications. Um, access to a qualified therapist um, for some of these interventions, the cost, if they need to provide a copay for weekly visits, can really be problematic. Um, so there are a lot of factors that may get in the way for patients engaging in effective treatment um, for anxiety disorders. This article in particular, and I just wanted to point this out. So in the background section, um, they I had asked for this article that they cited, but I don't have it yet um, from the library. 
they identified that um, a third of patients believe that psych meds can interfere with their daily activities. So 33% think that um, psych meds can interfere with their daily activities. And a quarter believe that they can be harmful to their body. So I was wondering where did this come from? This was a trial that was, uh, or these were results from in-person surveys. So they surveyed more than 1300 patients and talked to them about different uh, psychotropic medications. More than 50% of them said, yes, psychotropic medications, things like antidepressants are effective, but less than 50% are willing to take them themselves. So we think they work, but they work for somebody else. They're not going to work for us. And when they tried to dive into those reasons, because they feel that they could interfere with their daily activities or that they may cause harm, um, they have the black box warning regarding suicidality. So maybe part of that is the information that's available. Um, but but I just thought that that was interesting that there um, is really this dichotomy that's in place, which suggests that there's quite a few patients who medications are not a good option for them, um, even, if, even if we believe that they're effective. So we do need to look for other treatment modalities, which is really where the justification for this particular trial came from. So they're looking at how does mindfulness-based stress reduction compare? Now, why are they looking at mindfulness-based stress reduction? Um, I wanted to do a little bit of digging into this. There's been quite a bit of interest in mindfulness just in general. Um, it's been picked up by a large number of different places. Um, schools are using it. Uh, other healthcare institutions are using it. People are using it to help with burnout for um, different employee systems. And the medical community is looking at this for quite a few different indications, anxiety being just one of them. This particular intervention, um, this was developed by um, a professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, he had a PhD in microbiology, but as he was a graduate student, he um, attended a session uh, by Zen missionaries um, that came to the University of Massachusetts campus. And he was interested in learning more and did quite a bit um, of work learning about meditation and mindfulness on his own. And he brought the mindfulness-based stress reduction to the University of Massachusetts. Um, they have a whole institute based on um, mindfulness type interventions. They look at it for physical health conditions for as well as for mental health conditions. Um, pain is really one of the, the main focus areas to help folks with chronic pain um, be able to be a little bit more functional. This particular intervention is an eight-week course. Um, so it's an eight-week course that's done in a group format. So they use standardized protocols. There are books and supportive um, materials. There are also workbooks um, that can be included in the eight-week course. The individuals attend class sessions. Um, for our particular intervention, they were about two and a half hours a week. Um, other places, they may only be an hour. Some of them are an hour and a half. Some of them are done via Zoom. Um, so it's in per it's live, but remote. Others are done in person only. They can have um, day-long retreats. In some cases, it's a couple different morning retreats, or it can be one day long retreat. Um, but it's an extended period of time where they're learning about and utilizing some of the skills. And then there is daily homework. So they are asking individuals to continue to use some of these skills and incorporate it into their life on a daily basis. Um, again, for our particular program, they had 45 minutes um, of homework daily. So some type of activity that they needed to engage in for a total of 45 minutes each day. There are a few other mindfulness-based uh, clinical trials but it really depends on the type of mindfulness that's being used. Um, there are a variety of 
mindfulness meditations that could be used or other workbooks or other activities. This one is thought to be helpful just because it is standardized and it tends to be a little bit more of a consistent experience for what the, the participants are being exposed to. And that's why it was included for this particular trial. So the objective was if we see mindfulness, we think that it works. We have a couple small pilot trials that suggest it improves anxiety. How does it compare to something that would be a first line um, medication for anxiety disorders? So they compared it with escitalopram because that tends to be available relatively ubiquitously and it is listed as um, first line treatment for some of our anxiety disorders. So they wanted to see how does it compare and they're hoping that it's not inferior um, with the secondary hope of maybe having it added as a first line option in future treatment guideline recommendations. So how did they do this? This was a prospective randomized two arm parallel group controlled single blinded trial, which was a mouthful. I was like, holy moly. So they were looking ahead of time but the participants were being put in one of two groups. Um, the participants knew which group they were put in, but it was single blinded because the person who did the ratings did not know which group they were in. Um, so that's where the blinding was. It would be really difficult to blind um, interventions like mindfulness-based um, stress reduction. If you're asked to do homework 45 minutes a day, you're probably going to know which group that you're in um, versus if you're asked to take a pill, even if we give a placebo. So this was for um, eight weeks. <clears throat> eight weeks is the duration of that, um, the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. They had two follow-up appointments at 12 weeks and 24 weeks just to see if um, the symptoms were able to be continued to be improved, um, but that was really post-intervention. So they got one of those two groups and they were recruiting patients from Boston, from New York City, as well as from Washington, DC. Um, so from a generalizability standpoint, that may be something to keep in mind is these folks did come from larger metropolitan areas. The clinics provided um, information for patients who might be eligible for this, and there was a telephone screening um, appointment that was done to see, hey, let's see if you qualify. If it did look like they would be candidates for the trial, they um, were asked to come in to participate in a structured interview to verify that they qualified and then to consent to enrollment in the trial. They then were split into the two different groups. So either the mindfulness-based stress reduction or the escitalopram group. Now they could flexibly dose the escitalopram. Um, they started at 10 milligrams, but they could go up to 20 milligrams if the patient needed it. Those were continued for eight weeks. And then they did have some follow-up appointments um, <clears throat> for evaluation at weeks 12 and week 24. So who did they include? They included adults. Um, in this case, they defined adults as those aged 18 to 75 years, and they had to have a primary anxiety disorder. So generalized anxiety, <clears throat> social anxiety, panic disorder, or agoraphobia. If they had other mental illnesses, they were not eligible. Um, so bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, any type of psychotic disorder, Substance use disorder, if it was active within the last six months, then they were excluded. If it was something that was a remote history, they were able to be enrolled. Patients had to be able to understand what was going on. Um, so there did look to be some literacy requirements, which makes sense if you're being given information in that uh, mindfulness-based mindfulness stress reduction. Um, where they may give you, you know, guided meditations or things like that to, to look through. Um, they were not able to be on other psychotropic medications. Um, so they were able to be on trazodone. They could be on sleep medications or benzodiazepines. Um, but any other type of psychotropic medication, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics, they were excluded. Patients couldn't have any other type of medical condition. They couldn't want to be pregnant in the near future. Um, <clears throat> they couldn't be either starting psychotherapy within, 
they couldn't have started psychotherapy within a month or be actively engaged in other programs such as cognitive behavioral therapy. So if they're actively working through a program, they didn't want to disrupt that. They also, if they had previously had experience um, with mindfulness-based stress reduction, any other related program or engaged in regular, regular meditative practice, um, they also were excluded. The thought was they're already coming in with some of that experience, so it would be tough to determine if that was having an effect for them because they still had the anxiety disorder. So adults with anxiety disorders <clears throat> who required treatment their outcomes, what they were evaluating. They used the clinical global impression of, um, <clears throat> of severity. So how ill did they look um, from zero to seven, seven being really severely ill. But they also wanted the patient's perspective. Um, so one of the secondary outcomes was looking at the overall anxiety, severity, and impairment scale. Um, so the OASIS scale, not to be confused with the, um, the outcome assessment uh, OASIS scale that physical therapists use. They evaluated the CGI at baseline at week four, at week eight, and then at week 12 and 24. So they were looking at, did they get better <clears throat> or how ill do they look at these different time points? Um, and were they able to get better over time? The patients were on medication starting week one all the way through week eight, and they had medication assessments where they were looking at adherence and any issues with the medications at week one, two, four, <clears throat> six, and eight. And then they did safety checks. So they were evaluating for any problems, um, if the patient was in significant distress or if they were having um, adverse effects, they checked in with them weeks one, two, four, six, and eight. <clears throat> those really stopped within those time frames. Patients could continue taking um, the escitalopram and continue practicing their mindfulness-based practices after the eight-week time frame, but they were no longer being observed or supervised um, by, <clears throat> excuse me, by the um, investigators. So even if they continued on meds, they weren't doing those med checks or those safety reviews after that eight-week time frame. So what did they find? So they were hoping, well, this is a little smaller than I was anticipating. Um, they were hoping to get adult patients who had anxiety disorders. Um, that was who they were able to get. The patients on average, <clears throat> most of them had um, completed high school and had some type of additional training. Um, so about 20% had had some college, um, between 30 and 40% had a college degree. Um, and then between 35 and 45 percent actually had um, a graduate school degree. So they were relatively well educated. The patients primarily had social anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, and they um, they did have um, relatively significant moderate distress. I think maybe that's on this next one. Yep. Um, so their baseline CGI score um, was about a four and a half. So they were moderately ill, um, where it was starting to impair their ability to do some other things. There are two columns here. So these are the patients who were randomized. Um, so those that they put in a group, and then the completed protocol were those that actually finished the full eight weeks. Um, but as you can see, in terms of baseline, it was about four and a half for both of those groups. It was relatively equal if they were on other benzos or other sleep medications. So not too, too many. So was it effective? That's the big question. Um, they did see improvement. They saw improvement in both groups um, in the CGI score. Um, so it went from about four and a half to 3.3, 3.4 by week four. Um, and by week eight, it was about a three. Um, so where they would be more mild illness or have relatively few symptoms. Um, so in both groups, they saw that improvement. They did not see a difference between the two groups. Um, so they were watching um, from the non-inferiority standpoint and they set that um, 
I just had it and then I moved my page. Um, they set that criteria up ahead of time to determine whether or not um, they would be different. And they were saying that the CGI score um, was 0.495. So about a 0.5 difference in that CGI score would be demonstrating that there's um, that there's a difference between the two groups and they did not have that difference across the board. Interestingly, the other thing that they found was when they continued to follow up with the patients, <clears throat> they saw that at 12 weeks, um, they really maintained for that next month the improvement in the CGI score. So they were just falling below a three. And they did continue to lose folks, um, but at week 24, uh, they also had improved. So it appeared that patients who had improved and had mild symptoms were able to maintain that mild symptom severity, even after the, the specific intervention had um, been discontinued. I point that out. So for the medication patients, um, they did have quite a few patients who did not continue to take medication after that um, eight-week time frame. So most of them continued by the 12 weeks, um, but they were about 50% by the time they got to 24 weeks. Um, so even though they stopped taking it, they saw an improvement in symptoms. For the mindfulness-based intervention, they had more patients that were not consistently doing mindfulness-based activities. Um, so they said consistent mindfulness-based activities were at least four days a week. Um, so that number was uh, less than 30% by the time they got to week 24. But despite the fact that they weren't doing this every day, they continued to maintain those symptoms um, or maintain that improvement. In symptoms. So that improvement that they got from the mindfulness continued to go on even if they weren't doing it quite as consistently. And I, um, looking at that longitudinal data and the, um, the predicted CGI score, um, so that was an estimate that they were getting because it, essentially it scored 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, but they did use the averages. You see that those two lines are almost right on top of each other. So we saw a similar improvement in both of these patient populations. So what does that mean? It means that we saw improvement in patients who were moderately ill with anxiety disorders in both of the groups. So they didn't have to be on medication to show improvement. Um, and that improvement was able to be maintained despite the fact that there continued to be some discontinuation in treatment over those 12 to 24 weeks. Um, so I would say for clinical impact, it's a possibility. Um, it, it appears for patients who may have concerns or access issues with psychotherapy, but are not interested um, in taking a medication. As we saw, more than 50% of the respondents said, yes, these work, but not for me. I don't want to take them. This gives us another option um, that might be really effective for some of our adult anxiety patients. So I am going to stop my share here, and I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on this trial.